Well, here's the Thursday devotion, and uh, we're looking at AD 29, event 22. And we looked at the lost sheep, uh, Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 7, the lost coin, Luke 15, 8 through 10. And now we're going to look at the lost son. Remember, the backdrop of this is that the scribes and the Pharisees, as well as the sinners and tax collectors, are gathered around Jesus, and uh, the tax gatherers and the sinners uh, are impressed by the love of God and forgiveness available to them, while the scribes and the Pharisees are uh, judgmental of Jesus because he's hanging around with sinners and he's even eating with them. And so Jesus has told two parables about the lost sheep and how the shepherd goes out and looks for even the one and rejoices and then lends the spiritual application which is that heaven rejoices when the one repents, turns from sin and self to Jesus alone. And then he talks about the lost coin which doesn't even know it's lost and how the uh, widow or the lady um, looks and lights a light and sweeps the house clean to find it and again drives home the spiritual point by sharing that um, she rejoices and the angels in heaven rejoice uh, when someone repents and turns uh, to God and God alone for their salvation. But the lost son is a much more interesting story because there are three characters which we have to follow carefully. The father, the elder son, and the younger son. Now, it's quite obvious that the father is our heavenly father. It's pretty obvious that the younger son is the Pharisees and the scribes. And it's quite obvious that uh, excuse me, let's back up. It's quite obvious that the elder son is the scribes and the Pharisees and the younger son are the sinners and the uh, Gentiles of this world that uh, uh, have repented and come to Christ. So let's, let's take a look at uh, these three and see how this plays out. First of all, in verse 11, it says, uh, the father has two sons. Now, Jesus could have told a parable about just one son who went astray and was found and came home, uh, but rather he wants to contrast the two sons. And he wants to contrast them clearly to the scribes and the Pharisees, as well as the tax gatherers and the sinners. It says the younger son comes to the father and before the father is even sick, much less dead, says, divide up your inheritance. I want mine now. And uh, it's quite obvious that uh, even though back in those days it was quite likely that the elder son would get two thirds while the younger son would get one third, uh, that there was a pretty good size estate and it says that the younger gathered up everything that was his uh, and left. Now, before we go that far, let's take another look. It says the father divided between them. So keep in mind that the father has basically done what a lot of people when they're getting up in their age and perhaps in bad health immediately uh, put all of their possessions into their children's name so that when they pass uh, there'll be no arguments about who owns what and uh, that uh, the, the IRS will not be able to attack uh, the inheritance because it's not an inheritance at all. They already had it in their names. So that means that when the father divided the goods uh, the younger had his possessions and the elder had his possessions already. And that's quite a gutsy thing for the younger to demand an inheritance before the father even dies. But nevertheless, it says he went a long way away, a distance, and he squandered it, his, his inheritance, on loose living. And it says he spent everything. And then a severe famine came in the land 
and uh, uh, he became hungry he became in need and he attached himself to a citizen well obviously all of those friends that helped him go through his money were long gone uh, and this person that he attached himself didn't have a lot of esteem for the younger son because he sent him out into the fields to feed the swine which was a dirty job for a Jew since the Jews didn't consider the swine as a clean animal and uh, it says that he was so hungry that as he was feeding the slop uh, the rotting vegetables and things to the swine uh, that he would look for some that he could eat himself because he was so hungry. Now, when we look at this younger son, we find a very important verse in verse 17. When it, he came to his senses, he, he realized what he had done. Uh, maybe when he was out there in the field with the pigs and he was eating their food, he recognized how low he had gone. And he realized that he was dying of hunger and that even his father's servants uh, had more than enough bread to eat. And he says, I know what I'll do. I'll go back and I'll tell my father I've sinned against heaven and against your sight. Now, that would seem like it might be foxhole religion, uh, but it wasn't because he actually got up and left and went back to his father. And it says when he was uh, a long way off, his father saw him, had compassion, ran, put his arms around him and kissed his son. Uh, this is a wonderful picture of our Heavenly Father, that even when we're dirty, nasty, have been feeding the pigs, that he's still willing uh, to show that compassion and see us coming home to him. He runs and puts his arms around us. What a beautiful picture of the Heavenly Father. What a terrible picture of we, the younger children, who have squandered all that he's blessed us with and have to come running back to him. But we see that the younger son was sincere because he tells his father, in spite of the fact that his father has already run and received him back with compassion and love, that he still tells his father, I'm not worthy to be called your son. Make me a hired servant. But the father has no part of that. He quickly tells the slaves to get the best robe, put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, kill the fatted calf, and let's have a party and be merry. Now, stop here for just a minute and recognize the father in verse 11 and 12 has already divided the estate. Whatever the division was, whether it was one-third, two-thirds, or whether it was 50-50, nevertheless, everything that was left at the house really belonged to the elder son. Well, the father was still alive, it's true, but the division had already been made. So the robe was the elder brother's robe. The ring was the elder brother's ring. The sandals were the elder brother's sandals. The fatted calf was the elder brother's. And the father begins to celebrate with this son, this one who is back in his favor. When the older son is out in the field working and when a day is done, he starts heading for home. And as he approaches the home, he hears the music and the dancing. And he summons the servants and wants to know what's going on. And they tell him, your brother has come home. Your father has killed the fatted calf. Very likely they told him also about the robe and the ring and the sandals. And certainly you can put yourself in the elder brother's position. You've kept track of him because the text tells us very clearly that the older brother knew that his brother had lived a sinful, wasteful life and had spent all that he was given. The older brother obviously had the right to become angry because everything that was being given to the younger who had wasted all that he had been given <laughs> was really his. And when his father comes out to reason with him, uh, the elder brother 
says, all of these years I've served you faithfully and I've not neglected any of your commands and you never gave me a kid, never gave me a fatted calf so that I could be merry and celebrate with my friends. And it's interesting because the elder brother says, this son of yours, <laughs> not this brother of mine, but this son of yours has spent it all in loose living and yet you killed the fatted calf for him. And the heavenly father, the father says to his elder son, everything that I have is yours. Now listen, he's acknowledging that's already been divided. Everything that's there at the house is his. But don't be angry. Be merry and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and is now alive, was lost, but now is found. Oh, what a picture. That the scribes and the Pharisees should rejoice because those brothers of his have been found. They were once lost. They were once dead in their transgressions, but now they've been found. This contrast of the scribes and the Pharisees with the tax gatherers and the sinners is such an incredible, beautiful picture of exactly what was happening in Jesus' day and how we should rejoice that we were lost but now have been found. We may have squandered away all that God has given us to this point in life, and yet he still has compassion to receive him back, to receive us back to himself. Now, I just couldn't help but to think as I was preparing this message, is this still a picture? Uh, it was a picture then, but is it also a picture now of the nation of Israel and the fact that the Heavenly Father is still waiting for them to recognize that all of the blessings that he has for them are still theirs if they'll just come home to him if they'll just recognize that he did send the Messiah but they received him not is he still waiting for the nation of Israel to come home is he still watching and waiting patiently is he ready to run to them well, let's not be like the elder brother. Let's not miss out. If the nation of Israel repents and comes back to Jesus and recognizes that he is the Messiah, let's go in and celebrate with them that they've come home. It's my thought for the day. I hope it's your thought for the day. And I hope that you have a wonderful day. God bless.